Um, I've always wanted to go to India. I've never been to India. Maybe next time. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about this, which is a lot of it will be joint work with Jonathan Hickman of Edinburgh, Nets Cats of Caltech, and Rishang Zhang of Madison, and also the Institute in Princeton, I think. No? So So you can't see all of that writing, no? Or you can? Yeah. You can see all of it. Okay, uh, I see. So hopefully I will, uh, in the first lecture, I will talk about these things called the polynomial wolf axioms. Uh, it's a kind of strange concept. It's not clear whether it's a theorem or an axiom or what is it. And then I'll show how to apply this, these things to the Kakea maximal conjecture. And then to the Fourier restriction conjecture of Stein and also the Buckner Ries conjecture. So please, uh, please interrupt me whenever you want because I want this to be inform informal. So, so these are the key references. The, the, the most important ones are the, these papers of Larry Guth started this, the whole ball rolling, brilliant papers. And in this one with George Zal, and also in this one, they asked this question, which is to do with the polynomial wolf axiom question, which was then later solved by Josh in 4D and then myself and Nets in higher dimensions. And then combining what was going on in here and, and ideas from here and so on, advances for the restriction and Kakea conjectures in here. And then, and then also here. And, um, and then finally, very recently, Rishang with some collaborators uh, have applied these things to Faulkner as well. So, and so somehow uh, something worth saying is that, so the Kakea conjecture has been around for a long time, but um, these days people are mainly concerned with it because I think because is kind of a toy problem for the restriction problem and the restriction problem is somehow a toy problem for the buckner ries problem. And buckner ries problem is somehow convergence of Fourier series and integrals. And so that's worth keeping in mind. I mean, Tao has proved that buckner ries implies restriction and I think Morgan proved that restriction implies Kakea, but it doesn't go necessarily the other way. Okay, so I'll, I'm gonna talk mainly about the Kakea conjecture because it's somehow uh, simpler, uh, somehow. So the Kakea conjecture is just about tubes with no oscillation. And then restriction conjecture has got Fourier transform, there is oscillation and also in the buckner -Reese. So somehow Kakea is, is less messy because there's no oscillation. Okay, so some definitions. So all the way through, we're going to have delta as a small variable. And uh, we're going to consider very frequently these delta neighborhoods. So you take a set E, and then the delta neighborhood is just any point which is no more than delta away from any point in the set. So you make the set fat by delta. And so the, this tell, the Minkowski dimension is, is defined via, or can be defined via these delta neighborhoods. Something worth noticing is that we, we expect the origin, just one point, should be zero dimensional, of course. And so if you look at the delta neighborhood of a point, you get the ball of radius delta, which has size delta to the power n and rn, and that can be written n minus zero. So this zero is this zero. And similarly, a unit ball at the origin should be n-dimensional. 
And, and the delta neighborhood of a unit ball is just almost the same thing. It doesn't change. The radius goes to one plus delta, so maybe two at most. And that's always bigger than a constant, which can be written like this, n minus n. So this n dimensions is this n here. So uh, we say that a set has Minkowski dimension greater than or equal to alpha if you have such a band. So when you take the delta neighborhood, if it doesn't depend on delta, then you're n-dimensional. But if it does depend on delta, and this is true for all delta, so I'm gonna, everything I'm going to say should be true for all small delta. Uh, but I'm going to stop saying this all the time. So, uh, yeah, so that's the Minkowski dimension. And the, one of the first, one, one of the easiest versions of all these conjectures, which is still unsolved, is that the Kakea sets, which I'll tell you about in a moment, have Minkowski dimension greater than or equal to n. So they have full Minkowski dimension. So a Kakea set is a, is a compact subset of Rn. that contains uh, a unit line segment in, in every direction. Now, so a delta tube is just the delta neighborhood of a unit line segment. And a family, the, the, this, this blackboard script T will always be a family of delta tubes. And we say that it's, direction separated if the angle between the, the, the defining lines uh, is at least delta, right? We don't want two tubes to be too close together. And, and, and they can overlap, but the directions have to be separated. And so any such direction separated family of tubes, the, the, the cardinality cannot possibly have more than this number of tubes, because if you think about the, let's see if I can do the annotation. If you think about, if you think about a piece of the sphere, you have a sphere and then you take little delta caps on the sphere, then the sphere is n minus one dimensional. And so you can only have at most one divided by delta to the power n minus one. So the most num the largest number of delta separated, direction separated tubes is this number here. So, uh, 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 uh. so I'm not gonna worry about these constants. I'm gonna just throw them away now. So I often write things like that. It's not strictly true, but um, let's not worry. So the first thing to say is that surprisingly, I mean, it's been known for a long time now, but it's still, su still surprising to anyone who doesn't know it. You can have a Kakea set with arbitrarily small volume. In fact, they can be null, right? And how to see this. So here we don't have all the directions but we have quite a lot of directions, right? So we have a unit line segment here, we have a unit line segment here, we have one here, we have one here. And so we could, to get all of the line segments, we could just add up some more triangles. Now, if you divide this in two and push them together like this, then this manifestly is smaller than this, it has less volume. Now, if you repeat the process, divide like this, and then pairwise push this one into this one, and then this one into this one, and then this one into this one, and this one into this one, you get this. And that's already got less volume, but then you can push this one into this one, and this one into this one, and you get these guys. And then you can push this one into this one, and you get this. Now this has got a lot less, well, well not a lot less, but 
it's clearly smaller than this and you still have all the line segments so you can keep doing that in fact this is a construction due to Perón, not Besikovic he did a different one kind of similar I guess not maybe not that similar and you keep iterating this process you still have all these line segments but it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller so the the Kakea conjecture is about saying that okay it can be null the Kakea set can be null but it cannot be smaller than that so just like the point I don't want that happening. Um, just like the so, just like um, just like the point, the origin has zero Minkowski dimension, which is clearly much smaller than a line or a plane and a line in, in two dimensions. A line is much smaller than this set, even after iteration. A line has one Minkowski, is only the Minkowski dimension of a line is one. And the K conjecture says that even though these guys can be null, just like a line is null, a zero measure, it can't be as small as a line. It has to have full Minkowski dimensions. So they can be compressed as we just saw. We can have very small Kakea sets, but we don't want them to be too small as the conjecture. So you take a family of direction. Uh, one way of quantifying this is so, so for throughout now these T with sub E means that all the tubes are inside the set E. Right. And here is a formulation of the Kakea conjecture. I think this was first written like this by Larry Guth. Uh, and so remember, this guy can be no bigger than delta to the minus n minus 1. So this side uh, is always smaller than 1. Oh, if we take all of the, the, sorry, if we take all of the, 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 the depth, if we take this to be maximal cardinality, we've got a, 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 a line in, then this is 1. And then if we think of this E being the delta neighborhood of the Kakea set, and that will contain all of these tubes. And this inequality tells us that E, the, the measure of E is bigger than or equal to delta to the epsilon. And if that's true for all epsilon, then that's like saying that the Minkowski dimension is greater than equal is greater than or equal to n minus epsilon for all epsilon so that means this would imply that kakea sets have minkowski dimension greater than n so so that tells us that even though there are no kakea sets we that would tell us that the, they can be no smaller. And so this was proven in two dimensions by Davies in 71 and the two in two dimensional case, but in higher dimensions is still open. So we'll first of all we'll simplify the problem. So uh, also I don't want to worry about these these constants need to be here, as we just saw, because of this compression. The, 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 these sets can have, can be compressed. And this is the, so there's some logarithmic compression, but I'm going to throw this away as well. Just for uh, uh, one query. Uh, so here, uh, what do you mean by null Kakea sets? Could you uh, repeat that, please? So, now in the set is so zero zero the big measure for example so this if you keep iterating this process this gets smaller and smaller and smaller and you can prove that in the limit it's it's got zero the big measure mm -hmm. okay yeah thank you okay so
So let's think of an easier version of this question first. So rather than proving it for any E, we'll think about putting some geometric restrictions on E, right, on the set. So let's suppose that E is just a fat tube, which contains lots of, these are very, very thin tubes. Let's see if we can prove this inequality with fat tubes for, for when you have some geometric restriction on E. So the true Kikea conjecture doesn't have any restriction on the set E. Well, measurable. So if you think if E has length L, the tube has length L and width R, now, if, our, if, if the width is very large, then you're not really, then at least we know that this is a very big set. And then we know that this is always less than or equal to one because this can never be bigger than delta to the minus n minus one. So this inequality is trivially true if the tube is very fat. On the other hand, if the tube is thinner, if r is less than one, let's see if I can annotate, then here's the tube. And this is radius R. And so you can, you can fit only a certain number of delta balls inside this tube, right? And it's instead of being one divided by delta now, this is an N minus one dimensional set. And so it's R divided by delta. So that's the most number of the largest number of tubes that you could possibly have is this. And then you can rearrange that, bring this delta over here, and then it's less than this because you've just rearranged. And then if you multiply this by this, 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 the length has to be bigger than one because otherwise there are no tubes of length one inside it. And then that's just the measure. So we see this is a very, very easy inequality for if you make geometric assumptions about the set, right? If you put too much, because basically when you put some restrictions on the set geometric assumptions, you kind of make it, you force it to be a little bit bigger. And so this is easier to prove. Now I'm going to call this the Wolf axiom, although it isn't. Right, so the Wolf axiom was something. So what what do I mean by an axiom? So instead of assuming that the tubes are delta separated, I can just assume that this is true for all fat tubes, and any subset of the tubes. So you, you take take a family of tubes, and if you look at it, it must any subset of the tubes must satisfy this inequality. That's kind of it's quite already quite a strong assumption, not as strong as delta separated directions, but it's similar. And if it, if it has delta separated directions, then this is true. And so now I'm going to prove something about the Kakea conjecture, just assuming this. So you can either assume that the tubes are delta separated or that the tubes are satisfying this inequality for fat tubes. So Wolf's actual axiom didn't use fat tubes, it was to do with uh, delta neighborhoods of planes, but just for the, just to get the idea. So first, of, so, so what we want to do is prove the, to prove the Kakea conjecture, we need to prove this with an epsilon here. But we can prove at least this. So this already solves it in two dimensions, because when n is equal to two, we have this, we have what we want. So this is a proof in two dimensions. So First of all, we take this side, we square it, and we can rewrite it like this, because all the tubes are inside E. When if we, by Fabini's theorem, we take the integral inside, we get delta to the, this is the volume of one tube, and then we just count up and we get this. So this is a very simple identity, but then we can do Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and we have the measure of this set coming out. So if you put the identity of the characteristic function of E here, you do Cauchy-Schwarz, you get this and this, right? 
And now, because of the square, we can start working a little bit with this guy. So we look at this guy. We if we if we multiply it, this is just this this function multiplied by another function, very similar with t prime. And then you take the integral inside. The characteristic function of t times by the characteristic function of t prime integrated is just the intersection of t and t prime. And then we can divide up these t primes into subsets. So leave this one alone. And then we think about all the t primes of the which are quite close to where ti is a fat tube. So this is why we were talking about fat tubes before of length three and width two to the minus i centered on t. So, so because we're, we're looking at these tubes here, but we're only in, we can fix this t here. And then of course, we only need to consider the t primes which are intersecting the t. So we look at the ones which are, so if, if, if t prime is not inside this fat tube, then this is zero. So we can forget about them. Now, by the axiom we saw, remember, that I've rewritten this, we, delta to the n minus one was over here. And this is the set E. This is the fat tube. Well, it's slightly smaller than the fat tube, but we can just think of this as Ti. Yeah. And then that's the length. And then that's the radius. So th this is this three times by two i to the n minus one is just the, the, the measure of the fat tube. So that's what we saw from before. So this follows either from the axiom or it follows from the fact that the, the tubes are direction separated. And also you can calculate that because uh, we removed this set, so it's not it's it's close it's close to it's close to t, but it's not too close not too close. And so uh, if if i is very is is small, then we're we're looking at the tubes which are kind of perpendicular. The, 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 these ti's are somehow perpendicular to these t's, and so the the, vo the measure is delta to the n. However, when when i is extremely uh, small, uh, when when two to the minus i is like delta, then the tubes are somehow overlapping. They, well, they can overlap almost completely, and so then the measure is d delta to the n minus one. So so when we put this back into here, we have this. Uh, this goes in here. And then just summing up over all of these guys, we know that the cardinality is less than or equal to this. And then we we can sum over these i's in two dimensions. This cancels with this, but this is just a logarithmic scale. So you lose some log and delta here, which is acceptable. But otherwise, you're just summing a geometric series. And, and then this delta with this delta to the n minus one. Uh, sorry. So we have all the deltas together is delta was one single delta. And then you just sum up over this guy and you get the number. So if you once you sum up over this guy, you get this. And then you've got one delta. So this is delta to the n minus one times by delta to the minus n minus two. That's a single delta. And then all you do is you plug this back in here. And then you divide. So you have this. So this gives you the constant here. So you've got e times by the constant. And then you divide through the whole thing by this number, and then you get this inequality. So immediately you get a proof in two dimensions, like this. Yeah, uh, could you please uh, explain this again? T intersection T prime measure is uh, uh, less than or equal to delta power n divided by two power minus i. 
So we're looking at T and then there's a fat tube around it and we know that there's two fat tubes around it and we know that um, this T prime uh, is somehow uh, the, the direction of the T prime is somehow contained in here and so and it's not it's not close here so because it has the this forces the angle to be reasonably large and so the, the larger this angle is the the smaller this measure is you see so if the angle is Yeah. Okay. That's why you get delta per n, basically. Yeah, when the angle is very large, you get delta. This is just a delta ball. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and another thing, I mean, I'm not very convinced of this, to be honest with you, but I'll, I'll have a look at that and tell you if it's wrong later. Okay, so, and then another thing uh, is this, this, if you do Cauchy, if you do uh, Helder's inequality instead of cauchy schwarz you get P's here. You can do, the, if you just raise this to the power of P, you can do this Helder's inequality instead. And so that's something worth remembering for later. We're going to use this inequality later on to change from the, this is the Kikea version of the conjecture. And so if I write this with LP norms, so this is just the LP norm of this function. So again, if we can bound this guy from above, so here we did the L2 norm, but if we can bound the LP norm from above, we can divide things through and get the Kakea conjecture. So the, the Kakea maximal conjecture concerns this object, which we'll come back to. Okay, so so a real algebraic variety is defined like this. So you take some polynomials. So these P's will normally be from Rn to R, and you look at the zero set of the polynomials. Now a semi-algebraic set is, you can also include inequalities. And so something worth noticing is that a semi-algebraic, the complement of a semi-algebraic set, that these things just becomes non-zero and you have any, you can, the complement of a semi-algebraic set is a semi-algebraic set. And the complexity of a semi-algebraic set is the sum of the degrees of all the polynomials. So you may need, you may need, um, you can write the semi-algebraic set in different ways, but you take the minimal way and that's the complexity. So this, conje this conjecture is like the one we saw before, but, um, but now a tube, a fat tube is a semi-algebraic set, of course, you can just write some, some inequalities and get a fat tube. So this is a, a more general version of the previous conjecture for tubes, but not so, not, not, so, not, so, not so general as the Kakea conjecture, which just allows this E to be anything measurable. And so, well, if you could prove this for any semi-algebraic set without any bound, with a constant independent of the complexity, then you could prove the Kakea conjecture because every, every set can be approximated by extremely large 
complex uh, semi-algebraic sets with very large complexity. But the point is that we fix the 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 complexity and the and and then try and prove it for all of those semi-algebraic sets. Now this was a conjecture of Guth van Zyl, and then uh, Zyl proved it in four dimensions, and then Nets and myself proved it in higher dimensions. And I'd like to tell you, first of all, about the proof of this. So this is called the polynomial Wolf axioms, because it's, again, you can now, instead of thinking of tubes which are delta separated, the, the directions are delta separated, you could just assume that any subset of the tube satisfied this inequality for any se semi-algebraic set. And so, and then maybe you could prove use this to prove this inequality again, but with no uh, restrictions, geometric restrictions on E. But that's just, what, I'm just explaining why we call them axioms rather than theorem. And also uh, in the definition of semi-algebraic set, uh, I mean, the zero is uh, redundant, I suppose, right? You could put some other uh, constant also. Well, here, the, the the zero sets will be null, yeah. So they won't. They we, we're not really interested in this this part now. We're interested in this part. Is that what you meant? No, I'm saying that you could also, if I say less than or equal to say two, is it still a semi-algebraic set? Yeah, a polynomial less than or equal to two. Yeah. Okay. You could just take two on. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. You to get it to get the equal zero, you could take two yeah. strict inequalities. Yeah, I know. Well, you can, yeah. Either you need to do it with strict inequalities, uh -huh. or like this, I think, because then we can use this to subtract to get. But yeah, it, they're all there. This is there. This is there, and also strict inequalities is there. But but yeah, that would that would then be redundant. I think that's what you're saying. And uh, why are they called semi-algebraic? I mean, is there some property? Uh... Because this is algebraic. But and this is okay. semi. This I... is uh, almost algebraic. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you just tell me uh, what is that which is going to make a difference? I mean, the difference between the two? The one is a zero set of a set of polynomials, and the other one is actually a zero set together with uh, you know some certain inequalities are satisfied by another set of polynomials. What is what, what is the difference between the two? I mean, what exactly is happening out there in the semi-algebraic set? Well, uh, let me see if I can annotate. So here's a So here is a algebraic set, right? You just take x squared <laughs> plus y squared minus one equal to zero. That's algebraic. But if you take less than or equal to zero, then we're talking about the whole disk. So that's that's essentially how to think of it. So these guys are like curves, <laughs> if you like, and these guys are solid objects. See, but I mean, uh, I'm sorry to really interrupting you. See, in the case of, you know, like I mean, you, we already know that if you have got x is a multivariable and then these sets are not going to be just simple looking ones. They'll be really huge sets, correct? It's a common zeros of the set of polynomials they have got. So what I was just wondering is, so uh, 
what is the way that it is going to change or i mean maybe i think i have to look for an example and see okay sorry about that yeah carry on yeah it has non does it always have non zero measure i suppose right because normally well if there's no inequalities then yeah. it's just an algebraic set and then it's then it can have zero measure but if there's yeah you should think of them as always having non zero measure because here obviously if it's got if the, if the semi algebraic set has zero measure then you do have no tubes inside and this is trivial so we're only interested in semi algebraic sets with positive measure but technically they can have zero measure yeah because they include the algebraic varieties Yeah. Yes. So, uh, I'd like to prove this. Uh, and it involves a lot of well, it involves some basic algebraic geometry. And that is all some consequences of the fundamental theorem of algebra. So the fundamental theorem of algebra tells that we can take a polynomial and we can factorize it using its complex roots. These are complex, of course. And we need the, the leading coefficient must be here if these guys are here right and so first of all our consequence is the following that for most t most t in an interval are not close to the not close to the roots right some are very close to the roots but most of them are uh, satisfy at least this bound that they're not because you have, so if you look at your interval, this is the interval and you have a root here and you have a root here and you have a root here and you have another root here, then all of the points in between here are not close to any root, right? So you just divide the whole interval divided by the number of the roots, which is D and then by four, so and so you, you, you just take a small piece of each of these well if they're very close together you don't take any but if they're very two roots are close together then you can find some space elsewhere so most of the points on the interval are not close to the roots and so that tells you that that we can't have this inequality because we we can for most of the t, t's we just put this in this in here for each of these guys and even if they're complex roots by the way they're, they're still far away mo most of the time and so this is this is to the power d because you put that in and then we have this factor here so that's something that we will use that we can somehow replace we can bound polynomials from below most of the time. And another thing that we will use is that a polynomial doesn't map too many isolated points to the same value. So all you do is you think about this equal to some number, seven. You take it over and then and then that just changes this coefficient. And then you're looking to for the roots of a polynomial and there can only be D roots, right? Unless there are lots of, and of course it could be the constant, it could be a constant function, in which case they are not isolated points. They are, all the points are going to the same place. And 
This tells us that a real algebraic variety is intersected by a line at most b times. Why is that? Because you can change the basis so that the line can be written like this. So you just the, the line is going along the x one axis, uh, and it has well, it's parallel to the x one axis, and it has some position. And then you, and for the intersection can only happen when this, when the polynomial is equal to zero. And, and so you put T into the X1 coordinate and A in there so that this coincides with where this is zero. And now this is just a one, this is just a polynomial like this now. And so again, you're solving for the number of, uh, roots and you can have no more than b but you can instead of looking at this proof you can just think about it it's kind of obvious that if you put the line on the x-axis then this becomes a one-dimensional problem and then it's solved by this the fundamental theorem of algebra and then finally uh you have some kind of multi-dimensional version of this. So these polynomials so far have always been mapping to R, but we're also going to have polynomials which map to Rn. And then the Zeus theorem tells us that as long as you're mapping isolated points here, so the points here, which they're, they're not they're not, uh, there's a neighborhood around the point where f is mapping to a different place to f of x. That's an isolated point. Well, so you can't have any more than d to the n. So this should just be compared with this guy here. A polynomial maps less than d isolated points to the same value. That's fairly obvious. Well, this is a kind of multi dimensional version. Okay, and we will also use the change of variables formula that should, this should be very familiar. Well, quite often this is with another function written here and then, you, but when you change variables, uh, the derivative of the function appears. Yeah. And a higher dim dimensional version of this. So this, this function is mapping to R, but this one is mapping into R, from Rn into Rn. Then this is just the same thing. That, um, but now instead of having the modulus of the derivative, you have the modulus of the determinant of the Jacobian. So this is what we use to integrate all the time. And, and if it, the function is k to one, then you're adding things up too many times here. So you need to divide by one over k to get the, the, this, for this to be true. And then finally, we're in, in, this, in, the, in these talks, everything, all the functions are polynomials. So let's specialize to a polynomial. So if the polynomial is of degree d, then it can be at most k to one. Uh, so maybe these should be inequalities. These should be inequalities. So, uh, this is always bigger than or equal to this because the, poly the polynomial of degree d can be at most k to one. And so we're, we're putting in something which is too large here. And so this, let me change this. And so, so that's because what we were saying is that the, the polynomial can, uh, can only map 
so here, for instance, if the function, if the derivative is zero, then it's mapping. We're going to ignore that those points because this is zero, and then they're all mapping to the same point here, and they're not changing the measure of this. And so here, you can ignore the points where this is zero because by Sun's theorem, they map. Well, well, because it's an inequality in any case, uh, so this is fine. So uh, you can throw away all the points where this is zero and then just look at the points where, because that doesn't change the value of this. And then, so when this is non-zero then they're isolated points. And so at most it can be dn to one map. Anyway. So we're going to use that as well. And so I'm going to now start the proof of this um, inequality whenever E is semi-algebraic. So there's two more things that we're going to need, which is uh, Tarski Seidenberg theorem, which is a pretty serious theorem, and also Gromov's algebraic lemma. But I'll just introduce them during the proof. I don't want to state them too formally. So, first of all, instead of considering these discrete tubes, we're going to consider just all these lines. So, th this is the, the position, and this is the direction, and this is the, the line going in the direction of T. Uh, sorry, in the direction of D, and this is the parametrization, you know. So uh, this is the height as you're going, these are lines going up like this. And so T is the height. And as you go up the height, you move across because you've got some direction. So we're interested in all of these lines which are inside the set E. So every tube has got lots of these lines inside them, right? We've got lots of tubes inside E. And then we've got lots of lines like this inside the tubes inside E. So we just think of the parameterization of the, the, the position and the direction. And so the Tarski Seidenberg theorem tells us that if this is semi algebraic, then this set is also semi algebraic. Now, why is it not obvious? It's not obvious because of this for all T. So remember, in the definition of semi-algebraic, we just had inequalities. Now it's true. This is just an this is just some inequalities, right? This is defined by inequalities. So we find that the t's and the a's and the d's have to be inside bigger than some polynomial, smaller than some polynomial. That's just inequalities. But this for all t is not just an inequality. It's some it's they call it first order logic rather than zero order logic right you're using sort of extra symbols so how do we see that this is semi-algebraic using tarsi seidenberg theorem tells us that the projection the orthogonal projection of a semi-algebraic set is semi-algebraic now so let's first of all consider this set now, because that's semi-algebraic, and this is just a series of inequalities and so on, this is clearly semi-algebraic. And then if we take the orthogonal projection of this set onto, on down, then by tarski sudenberg it's still semi-algebraic. That's a big theorem. This, this, the, the fact that the, this, the orthogonal projection of a semi-algebraic set is still semi-algebraic is an th important theorem. And, and what is the projection? The projection, if we're saying that it's outside of e, uh, the complement of E, there exists some T which is outside. So then it's not in here because for all T, this is supposed to be inside. So this projects onto the complement of this. And then again, I can take the, so this is semi-algebraic, so I take the complement, and so I find that this is semi-algebraic. So that's not usual analysis, I guess. So 
but it's simple apart from this theorem. Now, this theorem was used to pr prove a theory in logic that, that implies the decidability of the first order theory of the reals. So what does that mean? Decidability means that every question has an answer. So it's obvious that the zeroth order theory of the reals, any question which just involves inequalities and equalities has an answer. But it wasn't so obvious that any question which involves a for all sign or a there exists sign has an answer. Now, the reason that it's true that the, the first order theory of the reals, all questions have an answer is because you can convert any question in first order into zeroth order. You can rewrite this set as just a series of inequalities of polynomials, which must have an answer. Well, it must become clear whether you're in the set or out of the set. Okay, so by, and by a similar argument, we can also suppose that there's only one position for every direction. And now note that there are many, many lines contain, many of these lines are contained in each of the tubes. Indeed, for every single tube, for every single tube, delta tube, we have lots of lines inside, right? And so we have a whole delta ball of lines in different directions inside. And so and so when we put uh, so if we just project this set onto the directions, we know that for every single tube, there is a delta ball of different lines. So we know that the measure of all of these directions is bigger than this because these, these tubes are direction separated. So each of the balls is separate over here, right? So as you project onto the directions, you get a delta ball for each tube. And so that's why this is bigger than this. So in order to prove this inequality, we just need to prove that this projection of this set, this orthogonal projection of this set onto the directions is less than or equal to the, the measure of the semi-algebraic set. Now the next big theorem we're going to use. So should I stop soon or so? How long have I got? It's a one hour talk, but if you want to take some more time for today, it's, it's fine. It's up to you. Okay, well, I can keep going for another five minutes. So another thing that we're going to use is Gromov's algebraic lemma. So, um, Gromov's algebraic lemma tells us that any semi algebraic set can be parametrized, oh. piecewise parametrized, by, now I'm lying at the moment, but I'll explain how I'm lying in a moment, by polynomials. So, somehow that's, remember, so the semi-algebraic set is defined by polynomials which go from Rn to R. And, and so, so it lives in Rn, right? The, the, well, so now we're talking about Rn minus 1. These directions live in Rn minus 1 instead of R. And Rn. But, so our semi-algebraic set lives in Rn. So now we want to parametrize it by polynomials which map into it. So they map from here into here. So now these are polynomials, multivariate polynomials again. So, so given that this, given that the semi-algebraic set is defined by polynomials, it's not so surprising. And the complexity is, so the, the complexity is about the degree of those polynomials 
and there's also a finite union. So it's not so surprising, I guess, that you can do this parameterization, but it's not exactly, you no, know, it's not, it's not as trivial as it looks at first sight. And I mean, in fact, Gromov claimed it was true and then it wasn't proven until later. By maybe Jonathan Pila and someone else did the first proof and then David Bourget did another proof. And then there's an even simpler proof now, I think. Um, so once we've done this parameterization, we've just changed this guy into this guy, and we wanted to bound this guy by this. So now we can just bound this by this for each j because these the, the number of these guys somehow it gives us a constant which depends on the complexity and the dimension, which is phi. And also the degree of this is bounded by this, so we're allowed to do this. And in fact, we're going to consider a full parameterization of L of the of this form. So this is the this remember this L was the set of positions and directions. And so this F parameterizes the positions, and this G parameterize parameter parameterizes the directions. But we'll also need these positions later on. Although we were just trying to bound the directions by the, the, the measure, in order to do this, we're going to need to reintroduce the positions again. Now, why is this not strictly true? It's not strictly true because uh, actually the parameterization is just given by smooth functions, not necessarily polynomials. And, uh, but with bounds on the derivatives. And so what we do is we take those smooth functions, we cut up this set into very small balls, and then we do a Taylor approximation of all of these, uh, of these smooth functions to make them into polynomials. And we need them to be polynomials because of what I was explaining before. We need these, we need, we need some K to one property. And so the polynomials naturally give us some uh, control on the number of times that things are repeated. But then we need more pieces and we need some dependence on this epsilon. Remember, I'm allowed in the, in the inequality. In fact, we incur a delta to the minus epsilon. And here it is. OK, so. I can, I can quickly finish this, but I guess it's going to be too fast for anyone to understand. So maybe I'll go over again next time. So well, let's just finish. So I'm just trying to prove this. Now, by the change of variables form, the measure of this is just equal to this. That's just by definition. Change of variables formula. This is always bigger than that one, even if it's repeating many times. So we don't need the injectivity yet. Now, what do I do here? I just, this doesn't depend on T, but I integrate over some interval of size one quarter. Remember T is the height of the lines. I can do this for free because this doesn't depend on T. I multiply by four, it's an identity. And then somehow I change back to the previous now I want to bring the lines back. So this is the position, this is the, the, the direction. And now I just tell you that I can bound the, the directions by this position plus direction. I'll explain why in a moment. And then this is the change in change of variables formula again. I go from here to here. Uh, and then finally, this is contained in E because all of these lines, these are the, this is the direct, this is the position, this is the direction, this is the height. These are the lines which are in E. So all of these points, as you change T, are inside E. And so this is just, uh, 
all of this all of this is inside e and so this give, so this is less than the measure of e these are these are the the slices of the lines and then this is integrating all over all all the uh, over the height so that finally gives us the inequality but i'm lying to you a great deal so what, where am i lying so first of all how could this be bounded by this that's the reason for that is because this guy this is the the determinant of this um of this matrix, which depends on T. So this is actually just a polynomial in T of degree N minus one. Now, as long as, and, and moreover, the leading coefficient of this polynomial is exactly this. So as I explained before, as long as we're not so close to the roots of this polynomial, this bounds this, as long as we, we lose some factor. So this is, most of the points T are not, are not near the roots. And so this is bigger than this modulo this factor for most of the points. So this IX, which I'm free to choose, X is fixed at this point. Because this is a polynomial T for a sim, if X is fixed. I can choose this IX to be away from the roots of this polynomial. This i x is a as an interval in t, and I can choose it so that we're not close to the roots, and so this bounds this. So that's a, somehow an application of the fundamental theorem of algebra, and then I do Fubini's theorem, and then I'm back to this uh, change of variables formula. Now, this is true in inequality form as long as this as long as this is not too many to one right and so if we multiply because this polynomial has degree d and that we have control over this d we know that this is no more than d to the n minus one to one and so we have that this is bigger than this as long as we multiply by this and so that so that these constants are okay and so that finishes the proof. Well, <laughs> I went a little bit fast there at the end. I can go, I'll go over this again the next time. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, but at the end, what I mean, I, I'm, I, I cannot say that I understood, but then actually, what you're looking at them when you're trying to do inequalities out here. Or at the end, you're just dropping off the, I mean, whatever that you have for F plus TG kind of a thing. You're just thinking somewhat like a translation or something. It's not better. I mean, I'm thinking it too simple, actually. Uh, it looks simple. Yeah, well, I guess it, it is kind of simple. But I mean, it did take us more than a year to prove it. And, you know, there was. Other people are trying to prove it. But um, in the end, I agree. It's it's pretty simple. Uh, so uh, the change of variable formula says that the uh, measure is less than or equal to, you know, whatever. Uh, say k too many maps, then that will be one by k, right? Times the, um, the uh, determinant. Isn't that? The, the, this one bounds this one divided by this. Yeah. OK. All right. OK, somehow I, I think I'm, I'm thinking it in the other way. I, maybe I'm wrong here. So which is larger? Well, I hope this one is larger than this one because otherwise I have a problem, right? But yeah, yeah it's because it's because. So I'm using it in both directions, right? But this could be many to one. And so, but I'm not dividing by the many here. 
this could be 17 to 1. And then I th then I could write 1 divided by 17 here. But at least I know that I have this, right? The, so here I didn't bother with the, the coefficient. So then I get this side. But if you take the, 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 the maximum number of the right, so that we know that this is less than dn minus one to one, then we have this way around. Okay. I mean, basically, we, we have an equality if we know how many to one it is. And so if we make that number too large, we can bound in this direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we make it too small, we can bound. And so here it's too small, we can bound in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here, uh, the key thing is for you to be able to write this cell uh, set as the union of, um, you know, these images of the polynomials, uh, I suppose. Yeah. Very key. Yeah. Well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so first yeah, to 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 be able to yeah because then once we had the well once we had this representation then you can then then it just becomes uh, somehow vector calculus no but but with these kind of tricky. So here, well, what, this is kind of tricky because this is telling you that sometimes it's not true that for at every height. So let me annotate. Yeah. Yeah. That it's not true that at every single height. So if you have lots of tubes, it's not true that at this height, for this is T here, right? At this height, things are very, very small. But what's it, what, somehow the philosophy is that if everything is going through here, then at different heights, everything is big, right? So somehow it's true that this sometimes does not bound this. However, most of the time, most of, for even though this, this is a bad guy, then that means that there's going to be plenty of other good guys. And that's somehow a philosophy that they use in, the, when, for, in other proofs of, the, of Kokea, Bounds. But here we get it kind of for free because of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Then it just becomes a kind of simple algebraic thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so just one more question. So like from the Besikovic uh, construction, um, then we, we went to the semi-algebraic. Uh, so, uh, I mean, how does one view that uh, particular construction in terms of uh, this semi-algebraic variety? Is it like some kind of limiting case of several polynomials? Or? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, so I'm saying like, you know, from the construction of that Besikovic uh, set, and then we move to this uh, language of semi-algebraic varieties. So how does one uh, view that limiting uh, set uh, in terms of these semi-algebraic varieties? Is it like the limiting case uh, of uh, lots of polynomials and inequalities? So uh, that, that those sets that I drew that, that, I, that were presented at the beginning, yeah. they are actually semi-algebraic sets, yeah, because they are, they are, um, yeah, at every stage, yes, it is okay. Yeah, because these are just yeah. polynomials with inequalities. However, uh, the complexity is growing and growing and growing. Precisely. So, 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 so when, when we go to the limit, uh, like how does one uh, see it in terms of complexity? Rather? Well, so, yeah, another way of thinking of the Kakea conjecture. So this, my constant here depends on D, depends on the yes. complexity. If you yes. could 
prove it with no dependence on the complexity, then you include those the limit of that those sets. And, and that, that, that somehow solves the pair conjecture. So, um, so um. All right, but in for example, in dimension two, does it uh, because in the beginning I remember in, in dimension two it is known the conjecture is known that's what uh, Davies uh, yeah so if we are uh, using this kind of uh, algebraic geometry and do you get a proof of this thing in dimension two? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I haven't thought about it because here is a proof, right, of dimension. Yeah. yeah. It's so simple that I'm not sure if these new techniques uh, can solve the, that problem. It would seem strange, strange to change this argument to something else. Uh -huh. No, I mean, uh, yeah. in this technique, you said that the constant is dependent on the complexity. So yes. perhaps. Uh... Uh, yeah. So, but I'm not sure if maybe if you go to the two dimensions, then somehow. No, I don't think it would, oh. I doubt it would solve the two dimension. And could you also please tell us like which uh, which paper uh, this thing is part of? Like this one, this the one presented yeah. today. Yeah. Is in this Gaffer paper with Ness. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And. Um, whatever Saurabh was asking. So for the Besikovic set, um, of course, n equal to two, it is proved. Uh, and uh, other n, uh, is the Kakaya conjecture proved for Bes Besikovic set? They exist in all dimension, yeah. They, 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 no, no Kakaya sets exist in all dimension, but they haven't proved that they have full dimension yet in higher dimensions. Okay. For instance, in 3D, the best bound is they know that three the Kakea sets in three dimensions have to have Mankeshki dimension greater than five over two plus epsilon, I think is the best bound. Mm -hmm. Due to, uh, so Wolf proved five over two, and then Josh, Zal and Nets Cats. Ah, no, Minkowski dimension, that was Cats, Tau, and Lava. They proved that it, you can put an epsilon in there. And then for Hausdorff dimension, Zal and Nets Cats proved that you can add this epsilon also. But a kind of unquantified or very, very small. So five over two plus 10 to the minus 10. Very, very small. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'll explain all of that next time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your uh, talk. And uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll meet next week.